General von Ludwitz's force had the Americans of General Anthony McAuliffe surrounded. The Americans were outnumbered, outgunned, and rapidly running out of everything else to do as the siege entered its third day. Von Ludwitz was certain that, whatever terms were offered, the Americans would be glad to accept. The reply von Ludwitz received? Well, let's just say it must have been disappointing for the German commander. This is just one of the remarkable stories of the Second World War, stories of victory against all odds. When all seemed lost, for one reason or another, these units kept on fighting, refusing to give in, even when everything seemed to be going wrong and being proved right in the end. Welcome back to the front, and thanks for joining our latest episode, the most unlikely victories of World War II. This video is sponsored by Enlisted. You can create your own unlikely victories in this World War II specific multiplayer shooter. It's absolutely perfect for players like myself who appreciate historical accuracy. Enlisted, while ensuring this historical authenticity, also manages to keep players exposed to thrilling action sequences through well-crafted and dynamic gameplay. Did I mention the game is cross-platform compatible? Enlisted is available on PC, Xbox Series X and S, PS5, as well as older gen PS4s and Xbox Ones with cross-play being available. There's also no purchase necessary just follow my link and download. Experience Enlisted's commitment to realism and maximum historical accuracy through features such as destructibility, allowing many objects on the map to be destroyed in battle, as well as construction, allowing those of you who pick the engineer class to construct fortifications and gun emplacements to help your team. The historical authenticity of the game's weapons, vehicles, and uniforms, as well as the modifiability of the maps are some of my favorite features of Enlisted. I also absolutely love the campaign aspect, where you can dive into the real World War II battles we all love learning about, such as the Battle of Moscow and the D-Day landings. All of this, combined with the multitude of other features offered by Enlisted, makes this game such a joy to play. So what are you waiting for? Head to the description below to download Enlisted for free on all major platforms and claim your bonus of three days premium time and several orders for troops and weapons for registering through my link below. Seymour Haiha was not a soldier. The 33-year-old from Karelia in eastern Finland was a farmer. His livelihood was one of growing and nurturing, sustaining life rather than ending it. And yet, over a period of just under 100 days, Haiha and his rifle would claim the lives of 505 enemy soldiers, earning him a chilling nickname, the White Death. Haiha's story may be an extraordinary one, he remains the deadliest sniper in the history of warfare and no one has come close to his confirmed kill count, but its fundamental elements give us some insight into what made the Finnish armed forces so successful in the opening months of the war. Yes, Haiha was a farmer, but his line of work also made him an expert skier, a skilled marksman, and a master of the inhospitable terrain and brutal winter conditions of Karelia. The White Death may have struck terror into the hearts of the invading Russians, but there were many other men just like him, with the same skills, the same backgrounds, and the same unyielding desire to protect their homeland. Finland and Russia had had an uneasy relationship for decades. The Finns believed that the newly created Soviet Union had designs on their eastern territories, and they were right. By 1939, as war broke out in Europe and a German incursion into the USSR became a very real possibility, forces on both sides of the Finnish-Russian border prepared for combat. On November 28th, or on the 26th according to some reports, the USSR staged a false flag incident on the border. Only days later, the invasion began. From the outset, the Soviets had their eyes on key strategic targets. One of these targets was the village of Sumosalmi, a crucial bridgehead on the way to the city of Ulu. When Ulu fell, Finland would essentially be split in half and a Russian victory would be almost assured. On December 7th, the Soviet 163rd Rifle Division arrived in Sumosalmi. They'd encountered only scant resistance on their advance from the border, and the 45,000 men of the division found the village abandoned. So far, so good for the Russians. But there was a problem. The Finns had destroyed the village, and so the Soviets, wary after a week-long advance through tough terrain in sub-zero temperatures, found little opportunity to shelter and regroup. An even bigger problem came the following day. The Finns lay in wait across the Niskanselka and Haukipera lakes. On December 8th, 
they attacked, pouring across the ice from the western shores, ready to retake the village and drive the invaders out of the country. The Finnish troops knew the land and they knew how to use the savage conditions to their advantage. But they were still woefully outnumbered, with only around a quarter of the manpower of the invaders. Their counterattack failed and the troops fled back across the ice to the west. The next day, the JR-27 regiment arrived, a newly formed unit ready to tip the balance in the Finns' favour. Once again, they advanced on the village and once again, they were beaten back, suffering significant casualties. Already at a numerical disadvantage, these were casualties the Finnish troops could ill afford. From Vietnam to Afghanistan and from the partisans of Yugoslavia to the original Zapatistas of the Mexican Revolutionary War, military history has taught us an important lesson. Guerrilla actions mean playing the long game. For the Finns at Sumosalmi, this meant weeks of waiting, forcing the Russians to show their hand. On Christmas Eve 1939, the Russians did exactly that, attempting a breakout from the now surrounded village and failing miserably against the better trained, better equipped Finnish forces. By December 27th, the Finnish ranks were swelled with two more regiments, JR-64 and JR-65. The Russians, shattered by their own failed assault, could only watch in horror as a reinforced enemy swarmed across the ice and out of the trees toward them. They fell back desperately and chaos reigned along the road back to the Soviet border. The men of the advancing 44th Rifle Division, intended to provide relief to the embattled Soviets at Sumosalmi, found themselves entangled with their own fleeing comrades. Over the next week, these hapless invaders would become moti, or bundles of sticks, as the Finnish guerrilla forces divided, isolated and destroyed the Russian column in the Battle of Rate Road. The Winter War was far from over. The Soviets would be back in greater numbers, and by March, Finland would have lost 11% of its territory. The bloody continuation war followed the next year as Finland struggled for survival, squeezed between the juggernauts of Soviet Russia and Nazi Germany. But for a few weeks at the beginning of 1940, grossly outnumbered Finnish forces showed their invaders precisely what they were made of. There would be no sleep for the men of the Surrey, West Kent, East Kent and Argyll and Sutherland regiments. At 8pm on April 22nd, 1943, 400 artillery pieces opened up, bringing their fury down on the German positions to the northeast. Even without this barrage, sleep would have been difficult. The men understood that the battle for Longstop Hill had begun, and tomorrow they would advance. The Axis forces had the high ground, and they outnumbered the British soldiers awaiting their orders to attack, but the Allies must prevail. The fate of North Africa was at stake. Longstop Hill is in fact two hills. The Jebel Amira is the western summit of the heights, while the Jebel Ra sits to the east. This massif is only around 300 meters high, but to a military force, this prominence is critical. As the last natural line of defense before Tunis, control of the peaks would be a decisive factor. Tunisia is one of the Second World War's special cases. As a French colonial territory, Tunisia became an outpost of Vichy France after Germany's advance through Western Europe, and its neutrality was confirmed after the armistice of 1940. But by November 1942, that neutrality was shattered as Allied forces launched an amphibious invasion of France's North African colonies, leading to direct fighting between the American and British invaders and the French defenders. Sweeping victories for the Allies in Morocco and Algeria set alarm bells ringing for the Axis troops in North Africa, and German and Italian forces scrambled to defend the Mediterranean's southwestern coastline. Axis troops scored significant victories, notably at the Battle of Kasserine Pass, but over the following weeks, they were pushed back eastwards into Tunisia. Meanwhile, Allied troops also advanced through Libya, approaching Tunisia from the southeast. For the Axis command, the message was very, very clear. Tunisia, the closest point of North Africa to the Italian island of Sicily, could not be allowed to fall under any circumstances. Admiral Jean-Pierre Estevar was the serving Vichy governor in Tunisia in late 1942. 
Unlike his compatriots to the west, he was not so quick to pick a side and opted to do essentially nothing, leaving strategic airfields open to both Axis and Allied forces. It would be the Axis who took advantage of this, airlifting supplies, equipment and men in vast quantities into the country. By the end of that year, the strategic fulcrum of northern Tunisia was in German and Italian hands. Fast forward to April 1943, and the situation wasn't looking great for the Allies. They had held the strategic high ground of Longstop Hill, but a combination of heavy weather and an Axis counterattack over the Christmas of 1942 had pushed them back. If the Allies were to have any chance of taking the capital at Tunis, they would need to first retake the Longstop Heights. Outnumbered by the German and Italian defenders on the summits, the Allies faced a daunting task. As the artillery barrage fell silent, the Surreys and the Argyles began their advance on Jebel Ameda, but took heavy casualties from machine guns and mortar fire. The West Kents and the buffs of the East Kent Regiment advanced on Jebel Ra at the eastern side of the heights, but they too came up against stiff opposition from a well-placed German regiment. The attack was in disarray, but in the first light of dawn on April 23rd, a new plan was drawn up. The Argyles, supported by two squadrons of the North Irish Horse, would concentrate their attack on the western end of Longstop Hill. What happened next ranks as one of the most astounding actions of the North Africa campaigns. Led by Colin McNabb, the Argyles adopted a box formation and advanced up the Jebel Ameda Ridge. Sustaining devastating fire from machine gun emplacements on the heights, the Argyles advanced behind a barrage of artillery, taking heavy casualties and swiftly losing momentum. When McNabb was felled, killed by an exploding shell, it seemed for a moment that the attack would falter, but Major John Jock Anderson took over command and led the charge to the summit. Emboldened by the sight of a wounded but seemingly unstoppable Major Anderson, the Argyles rallied. By the time Anderson reached the Axis lines, he was accompanied by only four officers and around 40 men of other ranks. They had made it up the ridge but the machine gun nests had survived the artillery barrage and hopes for the remaining Argyles were slim. Anderson, undaunted, personally led attacks on at least three of the enemy machine gun positions. His Victoria Cross citation states that in every case, he was the first man into the enemy gun pits. The heroics up on the heights had not gone unnoticed. The Surreys joined the fray, reinforcing the Argyles in the nick of time and securing the hilltop. Desperate to press home the advantage, the West Kents then advanced on Jebel Ra, but were pushed back. The following day, the Surreys succeeded in maintaining momentum, driving north and occupying the city Ahmed Ridge in the face of staunch resistance from Axis defenders. The following day, supported by Churchill tanks that made impressive progress across the rough terrain, Allied forces were free to unleash their full fury at the peak of Jebel Ra. The East Kent buffs advanced upon the Axis perimeter, but to the astonishment of the assailants and defenders alike, it was a Churchill tank that reached the summit first. Followed by three more of the war machines, their Bedford twin six engines screaming up the scaled inclines of up to 18 degrees. Surrounded by advancing infantry and dealt a crushing blow by Allied armor, the defenders surrendered, and the battle for Longstop Hill was over. Six months after the Normandy landings, Allied troops have fought their way across France and into Belgium. The tide of war has turned irrevocably. Aachen, the medieval capital of the German Empire, has fallen. All along the eastern frontiers of France and Belgium, Allied forces are poised for the final push deep into Germany. In Italy, the Allies are pushing northwards. Further east, the Red Army is driving through Hungary and the Balkans. The end, surely, is at hand. And yet, on December 22nd, 1944, it is not an Allied officer, but a German one who writes to his wife back home, describing an army that is always advancing and smashing everything. Chillingly, he adds, the snow must turn red with American blood. Victory was never as close as it is now. In the winter of 1944, the Germans were far from defeated. With elite units still in the line and with supply routes that were still fully operational, they would launch a devastating offensive, 
one that could halt the Allied advance for good and turn retreats into attack. This was the Battle of the Bulge, and at the heart of this was the Siege of Bastogne. The Belgian town of Bastogne, close to the southeast border with Luxembourg, is key to the German plans. From here, they can retake Antwerp and smash the Allied troops in the north. It's also the headquarters for the Allied advance. To put it simply, German forces must take Bastogne. But the town of Novil stands in their way. Here, a ramshackle force of American troops is keeping the entire German 2nd Panzer Division at bay. In this struggle of 400 men against 16,000 and fewer than 10 tanks against 120, the Americans are performing brilliantly. But after six hours of fighting, 26-year-old Major William Desabry is sensing defeat. He telephones the Bastogne headquarters, requesting permission to withdraw. Permission was neither granted nor denied, but the commander on the other end of the line tells Desabry that a battalion of paratroopers is on its way to reinforce Desabry's position if he and his men felt like sticking around. Desabry and his men went one better than to stick around. With 500 paratroopers now swelling their ranks, they attacked, derailing the German advance and fooling the second Panzer's command into believing that Novil was held by a far larger force. For two days, less than a thousand Americans kept the Panzer Division pinned down. By the time they finally withdrew on December 20th, Desabry's unit had suffered 25% casualties and lost all but four of its tanks. It was a defeat of sorts, but it had bought the Allies vital time. The defenses around Bastogne, just to the south of Novel, had been reinforced and were ready for action. The siege of the Belgian town was about to begin. That night, General von Lutwitz gave the order to encircle Bastogne and attack from the south. The Americans were cut off, outnumbered 5 to 1, and horrifyingly undersupplied. By December 22nd, Von Lutwitz offered the Americans the chance to surrender or suffer complete annihilation. General Anthony McAuliffe ordered a concise reply. Nuts. The German truce party, evidently unfamiliar with the American slang of the day, required further clarification. He means go to hell, someone helpfully translated. But the Germans had slightly oversold their position. They certainly had the upper hand, but they were not able to deliver the annihilation they promised. Their ground attacks were repeatedly pushed back by the resolute defenders, and the air assaults of the Luftwaffe, though effective, were only paid back in kind by American P-47 Thunderbolts. The air would prove to be the Americans' lifeline, and C-47 Skytrains ferried supplies into the fortress town. Bastogne vibrates with thunder of American engines, one officer noted. Bastogne was holding, but the situation was grim. On Christmas Eve, Private John Fitzgerald witnessed the corpses of two American soldiers as they were recovered from where they had been slain. As we watched them being placed into a jeep, Private Fitzgerald said, we can see some potatoes rolling from their pockets onto the ground. The ill-fated men had been desperately searching for food when they were killed. Just before 5 p.m. on Boxing Day 1944, the Christmas miracles the defenders had been praying for finally materialized. Cobra King, a lone American tank, made contact with the battered American troops at Bastogne. Behind her were units from George Patton's 3rd Army surging forth from the southwest. The following day, supply lines reopened, the operation to evacuate the wounded began, and the siege of Bastogne was lifted. Against all the odds, the Americans had held out. It would take more than two more weeks for Patton and his 3rd Army to push through Hufales and join up with the 1st Army in the north, ending the Battle of the Bulge and beginning the push westwards for Berlin. But it was the Siege of Bastogne that had halted the German advance for long enough to make this possible. Von Lutwitz had promised annihilation, but had reckoned without the bravery and resilience of the men at General McAuliffe's command. Off the coast of the Filipino island of Samar, 20,000 feet below the surface of the Pacific Ocean is the deepest shipwreck ever discovered. In 2019, humans laid eyes on the ghostly sight of a stricken destroyer 
for the first time in over 75 years. But it was another two years until the ship was identified. Emblazoned on the hull, still visible after almost eight decades, was a number. 557. This confirmed it. The wreck was that of the USS Johnston, and this small square of the seabed was the final resting place of some 186 men. Roughly half of the Johnston's crew who had been killed in the fighting off Samar back in 1944. By late 1944, General Douglas MacArthur was making good on his promise to return to the Philippines. He was returning, just like he'd said he would two years earlier. By mid-October, amphibious landings were bringing American soldiers into direct conflict with their Japanese adversaries on the Filipino island of Leyte. The battle for this part of the Pacific, it seemed, was going the Allied way. Out at sea, though, it was a little different. Though most of the American Marines and infantry had disembarked, they were still vulnerable to attacks from the ocean, so maritime supremacy was vital. Vice Admiral Jisaburo Ozawa had an idea. He changed course, heading toward the island of Leyte. The American Admiral Halsey, sensing a wounded and flighty enemy, and believing that American airstrikes had neutralized much of the threat in the area, opted to pounce. Drawing upon all of the ships in his command, he set off in pursuit of Ozawa's force. This would prove to be a controversial decision. Ozawa's force was a decoy, and Halsey had fallen for it, hook, line, and sinker. For the Japanese, Ozawa's gamble had been even more effective than they had anticipated. Misinterpreting an intercepted radio message from Halsey, Japanese intelligence believed, surely, that some kind of force would be protecting the San Bernardino Straits of the island of Samar. No, the Japanese under Admiral Korita traversed the strait unopposed. The later gulf was open and only Rear Admiral Clifton Sprague's Taffy 3 task group stood in the way. Woefully mismatched, Korita's force outnumbered Sprague's by 11 destroyers to 7 and was stronger in almost every dimension. The battle was not expected to last long. But Kurita was still not convinced. He refused to believe that Halsey would have left such a strategically important area open and vulnerable, and he could not comprehend how Ozawa's decoy run had been so successful. In Kurita's mind, the force he encountered off the island of Samar was not the modest Taffy 3, with its six miniature escort carriers, three destroyers, and four destroyer escorts. Halsey would surely not have made such a blunder. This force must be far bigger. And from the way the Americans fought, we can't blame Kurita for thinking this. Sprague may have lacked ships, but he had aircraft. His carriers launched their planes and then retreated to hide out in the squalling weather to the east. Kurita, eager to respond, suddenly found himself struggling with a logistical nightmare. The ships of his huge fleet, acting out a general attack plan in close quarters, cut across one another and trod on one another's toes in the scramble to engage. A lumbering, cumbersome goliath against a lithe, nimble David. Sprague's destroyers were nicknamed the Tin Cans. If this doesn't sound particularly impressive, there's a reason for that. The things were lightly armed and designed for swift escort action. Vulnerable to counterattack, they simply had to keep moving, and they did, harrying the Japanese forces and laying down a smoke screen for their torpedo runs. One of those destroyers was, of course, the USS Johnston. Maneuvering with speed and agility, Johnston and her crew struck out at the Japanese repeatedly, scoring a number of hits as it bobbled and weaved like a boxer. In what has been described as more like medieval melee combat than a 20th century naval battle, the Johnston rocked the Japanese fleet, largely escaping unscathed until a devastating salvo from the Japanese Yamato battlestrip struck the Johnston full in the bridge, killing a number of sailors and ripping the fingers from Commander Ernest Evans' left hand. The crew of the Yamato, in the confusion, were jubilant, reporting the sinking of a cruiser. They were wrong on both counts. There were no cruisers in the American force, and the Johnston was not sunk. An hour passed, and the Johnston fought on, engaging in straight shootouts with numerous Japanese ships, then slipping away into the smoke that now hung thickly across an enormous area. 
another hour passed. USS Johnston was now alone. Her fellow destroyers knocked out of the fight by Japanese fire, and she was battered. By 9.45 a.m., the order was given to abandon ship. Johnston went down in 25 minutes, taking 186 souls with her. Evans disappeared in the chaos, perhaps killed by a shell or drowned as the destroyer sank into the Pacific. He received a posthumous medal of honor for his actions off Samar. A third hour went by. With the destroyers gone, the escort carriers were now horribly exposed. For the men of the USS St. Lo, there must have been some confusion as to what they were hearing. The familiar drone of a Zero fighter, but with its pitch sifted up into a squeal as it bore down upon the ship. Just before 11 a.m., Lieutenant Yukio Seki set his sights on St. Lo and did not change his course. Seki's would be the first kamikaze attack of the war and a devastating psychological and physical blow. But Korita had seen enough. His ships were largely intact, but the combined effort of the Johnston, the other American destroyers, and the fleet's air power had left his command in disarray. No longer able to effectively control his force in battle, Admiral Korita withdrew. For their victory, around 1,000 Americans paid with their lives. Their services on that October morning in 1944, as American troops swept back into the Philippines, would not be forgotten. Two forces meet on the battlefield. Only one can be victorious. Only one will win the day. But which one? In some cases, it's going to be the bigger force. The one that can put the most soldiers in the field. But not always. Warfare is all about finding an advantage, no matter what form that advantage takes. Across this video, we've seen small forces score victories against far larger enemies. We've seen armies using the terrain or conditions to their advantage. We've seen soldiers drawing upon that all-important motivation of fighting on home turf. We've seen strategic and tactical advantage, and we've seen armies come out on top thanks to sheer force of will and tenacity. There are plenty of ways to gain the upper hand against an enemy. The weight of numbers is only one of many. But what do you think? Which of these is the most jaw-dropping victory of the war? Which other remarkable events of World War II would you like us to cover? Let us know all that and more in the comments section below. And as always guys, thank you so much for watching and I hope you learned something new. Thanks again to Enlisted for sponsoring the video. Remember to check out the link in the description below to get the game for free and secure yourself a nice bonus. What are you waiting for?